Hello, my name is Peter Lord. I'm the moderator for the next half hour of this panel discussion. The, pa the purpose of the panel discussion is to enlighten the public on the national export strategy development process, its relevance to St. Lucia's national um, development thrust, and hopefully to stimulate interest in the participation in the process. We have with us three panelists. Uh, um, I'd like you to introduce yourself. Uh, good morning, good morning viewer, and thank you for having me here, Mr. Lord. I am Jacqueline Emmanuel Flood, and I am the Chief Executive Officer for the Trade Export Promotion Agency, which we commonly refer to as TIPA. Thank you. My name is Paula James, Executive Director of the St. Lucia Manufacturers Association, and we are here to participate to ensure that what is needed to help drive the sector is taken into account. Good morning, fellow panelists and uh, viewers. My name is Thomas Samuel, uh, Trade Advisor, Director of International Trade in the Ministry Department of Commerce. And our ministry uh, department is a lead agency of government involved with the National Export Development Strategy. Thank you. As we proceed, I would, I'd like to list out some facts about St. Lucia. St. Lucia is ranked 186 in terms of exports in the world. In 2015, St. Lucia exported 87.2 million US dollars. In 2016, the value of domestic exports contracted by about 12.8%. Visitor arrivals declined 7.3%, and banana revenues declined 11.2%. Uh, Mrs. Flood, uh, why, why a national export strategy? Well, export is a, it's a national effort. It's not something that we could necessarily focus on at a micro level. It's a part of a country's development thrust. So it needs to be approached at the micro level. It's part of government development policy. And so it is important that we take that kind of scope of it and we bring together all the relevant parties to look critically at where we are as a country. Um, as you, um, I think, already alluded to, exports starts up produced on a country by country basis is how one country competes really against another so for us a national export strategy is important for us as a country where we could look at our potential as a country and how we develop that potential for export growth um, it is a very involved process it involves both the public mm -hmm. who sector who are always at the forefront in terms of uh, make, um, negotiating agreements for trade, etc. So they too have a perspective as to where the opportunities are and which countries that we have favorable relationship with for trade. And it also involves the private sector who are the producers of the goods and services that we export as well. And also those persons or institutions that provide services along the chain, like the, the, the value chain, like customs, transportation, etc. It takes all of that collectively to come together to develop a winning strategy for export development. And so a national export strategy is that summary of what we all collectively can do together, or we believe should be our priorities in order to see our export sector grow. Thank you. Um, so this is a strategy. I'm assuming that it is part of a, some kind of trade policy. Could you tell us something about our trade policy Dr. Samuel, and uh, what are the issues that uh, our business folks should be aware of in terms of exports? Well, we are a small open economy. And so uh, because of that structural reality where we, we really depend on engaging the rest of the world. And so we have basically a trade policy uh, based on uh, trying to get maximum access market access to first of all our, we have our regional space and beyond so we are we are a member of the WTO and so we are guided by our commitments and obligations under the WTO framework um, so the, the as an open economy we reduce unnecessary restrictions that's a general thrust and given our sensitivities and stage of development we would necessarily need to have, we have crafted with the help of our regional and part international partners a policy, policies that would advance our development taking into consideration our, our sensitivities. So, um, but there are a number of challenges as you indicated. 
um, challenges to stay within the rules. It's a, a rules-based um, environment, and um, where we the economic uh, theory suggests that excessive protection is harmful to countries in the long run. And while we do need to protect fledgling and 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 uh, companies and, and sectors, um, we need to also help them compete by engaging through innovation, through, by taking proactive measures that allow them to, 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 to develop competencies and, and strengths and to, you know, to align their resources in line with their comparative advantages and so on, so um, as to ensure that we have sustainable uh, uh, operations in terms of firms that don't constantly need uh, government support and, and so on. So um, the trade environment really is, is, is a challenging one <laughs> altogether, especially for small states. And um, we have been trying to draw attention to the rest of the world, especially to our peculiarities we given the smallness and our vulnerabilities. And so our policies generally reflect these realities um, where we try to uh, build from the bottom up strong strong companies and, and try to discourage a waste of resources in areas that are not likely to be very beneficial. So in essence, um, and that work is being done with not just by St. Lucia as a, as a nation, but in collaboration with our regional um, framework like the OECS and the CARICOM and of course um, other uh, donor and um, bilateral partners um, trying to help us navigate that environment I've just tried to describe in terms of the challenges in which we must operate. So um, in essence, this is, this is the sort of uh, logic that underpins much of what we've been doing in terms of crafting national trade policy. Uh, Mrs. James, as a representative of SME, who are the major beneficiaries if we have a successful export strategy. Um, Dr. Thomas talked about innovation and, and quality management and so on. What is, what is SMA doing to foster innovation among its members? Well, for us, I think it's eight years now, we mm -hmm. have gone into these quality awards, mm -hmm. whereby we do an audit using the Bureau of Standards to go out into the audit in the various factories, both large and small. And that will give the manufacturer a sense of what it is they need to fix, what it is they need to do to start becoming export ready, especially the smaller ones. Because we see a lot of young persons coming in with a lot of innovative ideas. But with regards to some of the standard, simple things that they need to do, they're not away. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to say innovate, but we also need to say their standards. Mm -hmm. And we, would, we encourage them to do the standards for the local market to start with, so that once you are inculcated in that manner, you will continue to produce your product with a quality standard. And then you could move from that standard into the next standard and you get ready to export. But even that, it's a serious cost. So that too can be an impediment for them because standards are very costly. Okay. Um, Mrs. Flood, uh, tell us about TIPA and its role in this whole process that she just went. Okay. Um, in, very, in very simple terms, we are open country, open economy, small, as mm -hmm. Dr. Samuel said, mm -hmm. and everything we we need, almost everything we need, we have to import it. Oh, and that, and it's, oh, a, it's a simple mass, a simple relationship. If we're going to have to import goods, we need foreign exchange. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we must be able to earn that foreign exchange mm -hmm. so that we can buy the things that we want. It's like, you know, it's like I'm planting, planting, and somebody's planting mango, uh, growing mangoes. I want the mangoes. We need to find a way to exchange, and the, ex the medium for exchange is forget foreign exchange. You must you must buy the goods in foreign currency, and so countries like ours need to be able to earn. We must boost our capacity to earn foreign exchange. We do that for tourism, where people come and they enjoy our goods and services here. We still sell something to them to earn it, or we can actually export. We can take the goods and services and s take it out to where the consumer is, and to do that you need a sort of a driving force to do that. And a few years ago when we did our very first export strategy, um, one of the recommendations that came out of that is that you needed an institution to be this, to spearhead this, to lead this, to go out there and to help companies sell their goods and services outside, mm -hmm. to help them market and promote 
to create a sort of a brand that people can recognize. Now, when you go out and export into the global marketplace, you are just one small, little, tiny island in a stream of hundreds of countries mm -hmm. that are all <coughs> trying to do the same thing, try to get to the same markets as you. Some of them are much larger. So you do need to have to, it's a task that requires some level of focus. Mm -hmm. You must need special skills to do it, in mm -hmm. order to, to understand the global business environment, to understand marketing and promotion. And that's how TIPA came about. So the government of Indonesia decided then, it already had a tourism promotion agency, it had an investment promotion agency, but export was a special, specialized area, and therefore there needed to be an institution to take that baton and run with it. And that's how TIPA exists. So TIPA's job is to spearhead Indonesia's export thrust, mm -hmm. to help companies export, find markets overseas, we provide First of all, research, market intelligence. We find out who will buy our products. We find out who we're competing against. How do they price point their products? How do ours compare? Where do we, f you know, we find niches so that people, we can find consumers, first of all, and distributors who may want to carry our products in the market. We go out, we take firms out, we help them, show them what they're supposed to do when they're out there, how to engage with buyers overseas. Mm -hmm. All of these things require some capacity building, and so we do that. As um, Ms. Mrs. James pointed out, the whole issue of quality and standards, well, she's taken the baton of that. We cannot over, uh, overstress that, because when we go out there in, and we promote our products, you are competing against other people, and you really do have to be the best. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to meet the standards. So we also support companies in making sure that they acquire those standards that they need to enter those markets. Usually the standards is really the entry bar. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. can't make Market it, yeah. if you can't make it, you just don't get in. Yeah, right. You know, it really is effectively what opens and shuts the door mm -hmm. in, in trade. So we do more, all of, all of that. These are the kinds of services that TIPA provide. We also provide um, information. People who want to do business with us, they want to find out about our export sector, who are the people they should contact. We actually have an inform trade information platform mm -hmm. that we are at on the internet, and we have put people in, in our staff who focus on that a lot so that we can answer questions and give information to our exporters. And we work very, very closely with the manufacturers um, the and the service providers mm -hmm. so that we understand what they do, we can re represent them effectively mm -hmm. in the marketplace. It's probably a very detailed approach, but I kind of want to give you a, a practical sense yes, yes. of what it is that TIPA does. All right. Thank you. Um, for SME, uh, Mrs. Flood talked about uh, market entry requirements. Um, we'll go to a break now, and when we come back, we'll talk a little more about its impact on your membership. How do I decide which telecommunications service provider to use? When choosing a mobile, landline, cable TV and internet service provider, or changing the one you currently use, here's what you should think about in order to get the best service to meet your needs. Why do I need the service? What is the quality of service offered? What are the rates? Are there hidden charges? How much can I afford to pay for the service? What are the customer service obligations of the provider? Not satisfied with the service? The choice is yours whether or not to use the service. This message is brought to you as a public service announcement by Ectel, the NTRC, and this station. Mrs. James, um, Mrs. Flood talked about uh, the, 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 the various areas and particularly about market entry requirements for um, the assistance that she's providing to a membership and so on. And uh, I wanted to know about... Um, what are you all doing about fostering productivity, the improvement in productivity among your membership? Um, we conduct training ourselves within the manufacturing sector. Mm -hmm. uh, last year we did a customer service and um, human resource. And we had a number of companies, at least 30 persons came mm -hmm. in from within the sector to go through that process. Because for you to be able to be productive, you need to understand what it is your customers want, how you have to go out there and sell the product and be up and up to stay in a competitive environment. A lot of them have put people out to actually go and monitor the supermarkets now to see how the product is moving, where on the shelves the product is, for you to go back and see if you can move it from the bottom to the top and start getting a good eye for your product and space, shelf space. So we do the training within ourselves, among our sector, mm -hmm. to try and get our members to a certain level mm -hmm. and to understand and appreciate what it is they need to do. Mm -hmm. 
we have the new ones coming in and a challenge we have is testing a product. We've been hearing that the lab is coming up at the Ministry of Agriculture. We're hoping when the lab is open, it should be able to test some products for us initially because to test a product, you have to send it either to Korari in Trinidad or somewhere in Jamaica to get it tested. And that too is also a challenge for us in the sector with the, the new ones coming into the market. And we have some fantastic products coming in, but before you can start saying, hey, we're ready to export, you need to get that product tested. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping with the lab getting ready to open in Union, we will hear the good things that's gonna be tested at the lab in Union. I'm just curious, uh, do you all have any relationship with the Productivity Council? Yes, we do. We work very closely with them. They use us, as a matter of fact, to do their benchmarking. Mm -hmm. They use the manufacturing sector to test the tool because they have brought, they have done a tool, I think they brought in a university from London mm -hmm. that came in to help them prepare a tool so they could send it out into the market mm -hmm. and they use the manufacturing sector to test it. I think they are finished, so they're just fine tuning now so that they can send it out to every company to use it as a tool to measure productivity. Okay. Dr. Samuel, we are part of CARICOM, OECS. <laughs> we also a signatory to the Economic Partnership Agreement. Uh, with the EU. Right. Um, what are some of the unexplo unexploited opportunities available under those arrangements? Well, based purely on the level of uh, participation of our firms in terms of the volume of exports, if mm -hmm. we have to use that as an indicator, there's a world of unexplored opportunity there. Um, there's a lot to be done, even in our regional space. If you look at, um, first of all, we have the OECS. The OECS is our backyard, and really we need to increase the volume of exports fr moving within that space, and St. Lucia needs to do that much more. Um, we need to see commercial presence. Um, of our firms uh, establishing um, offices and uh, various uh, market entry strategies. In other words, um, being on the ground in some way through partnerships, through, through some alliances or whatever, we need to see that happening. So that th these are opportunities that are there because essentially it's a common space. Um, and that also extends in large measure to, to CARICOM as well, as far as the movement of goods. We have something called the CSME, the CARICOM Single Market and Economy, although that aspect is not fully in place yet, um, really to create a, a, a regional space for, for um, building critical mass to allow firms to uh, achieve as close as possible the economies of scale by ha not having to deal with, to have more competitive goods um, that can move freely within the region as, as long as they meet, of course, the national or regional standards as was alluded to by my colleagues here. Um, and so what I'm saying to you, there's a world of, as far as market opportunity yeah. in our bilaterals, for example, let me, I would like to share with those that are listening, we have non-reciprocal arrangements where our goods can enter those markets duty-free and the reverse is not true, where their goods are not allowed at this juncture to come into St. Lucia to, um, to compete. Mm -hmm. Now, this opportunity needs to be, you know, we need to take, take advantage of this one. Under the EPA, the, about uh, a significant percentage of our, uh, of our trade in terms of our goods, in, in terms of the tariff universe, is allowed to enter the European space duty free. Okay? What, what we need is activism where firms, you know, avail themselves um, through the ministry, through TIPA, which has been a, been a great job, um, through uh, Caribbean Export, who is, which is our regional counterpart, um, you know, to, to get advice, get information on, you know, all market profiles. Um, they have a lot of things like business-to-business -business arrangements taking part to begin to convert that opportunity into tangible benefits for themselves. So, um, in, in, in the most succinct way I could say to you that there's a lot of unexplored opportunity. We need to, for example, come together, form joint, do joint ventures. We do not all need to do all ourselves. You know, we need to um, do things like um, go out there with missions and um, look at the language issues. For example, in Latin America, bring, you know, if it's, it's Spanish, is language is a problem, we need to try and get around that. 
Martinique, right in our region, we have the French, uh, what they call um, overseas territories or the European, the DOMS as we call them, or, or uh, what they call uh, outer, um, what's the term now? It's a French term to mean overseas territory. Mm -hmm. All throughout our region, that's our backyard as well. So all of that, we have um, pre preferential market access where our goods, subject to some uh, local, um, uh, local administrative uh, or municipal kind of requirements in terms of, uh, say, taxes or whatever, generally we have um, duty-free, quota-free market access. All right. Um, we are about to go to the break. Uh, when we come back, I have one more question for you along those lines because apparently there's a gap between the arrangements that are made and the understanding of the business people. And yes. I want to know what effort is being made to help the people understand the arrangements we make mm -hmm. on the international level and how does it benefit them. I have my mobile, landline, cable TV and internet service. If I have a problem with any of the services, what should I do? Here's what you should do to resolve the problem. First, get and fill out a complaint form and lodge your complaint with the service provider. If after 30 days there is still no solution, you may contact your National Telecommunications Regulatory Commission, NTRC. This message is brought to you as a public service announcement by Ectel, the NTRC and this station. I just wanted to know, is there any effort uh, when we sign on to a particular agreement, is there any effort being made to educate the beneficiaries of that agreement as to what opportunities are available? Just, just a simple question. Um, short answer, yes. But um, it's a very uneven um, experience because some, some countries are a bit more aggressive or they have the requisite structures that are able to, to um, you know, take the opportunity and run with it. Sometimes there's also the orientation. A lot of companies are already outwardly oriented and so mm. they're more receptive. They generally scan the environments and are looking for opportunities. So in other words, is there, uh, the, the, from the, the, the trade policy people who make an effort, are making efforts to educate business people well we do out um, what they call um community outreach um, um initiatives with especially through the of office of the trade negotiation they would come around through the member states be on television and programs like this um they speak with our bso's they speak with um you know our trade support um organizations to try to get the same message out there to get people to see that there are opportunities and encourage them to take avail themselves okay. to these opportunities. All right. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Flood, uh, we have gone through phase one of the National Export Strategy Development Process. Mm -hmm. Could you just give us an overview of that? Well, I think it kind of leads on from the questions that we have had. Mm -hmm. All of the things we talk about, productivity, mm -hmm. um, trade agreements, are all very important in the whole process of developing an export strategy. Mm. You need to really look at where you are as a country, what are the challenges that exist on what we call the supply side at the mm. production level, some of the issues that Mr. James talked about, productivity. You know, how do we match up and where do we have an advantage? Where, mm. where are we strong? What, is, what are the unique things about us that would make our goods and services stand out and sell out there? We also need to take consideration of the agreements. You know, where do we have agreements and where, they, where are the unexploited opportunities in those agreements? And so the first phase of the national export strategy kind of looked at all of that. You know, what are the, the, the weaknesses, the, you know, what, what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages, what do we need to fix? And that process was it involved most of the private sector. I mean, we do have what we call uh, a core team that is post, um, b businesses, institutions from both public and private sector that come together to form sort of the expertise needed to provide it for the, the export strategy. We had the International Trade Center in Geneva, which is a joint institution of the WTO, the World mm -hmm. Trade Organization, and the United Nations yes. that exists to focus and specifically on trade. And they do have within their ranks very many trade experts in different areas. Um, they provided technical support and worked with a team here in St. Lucia. So in addition to the core team, we also had a technical support team from the Ministry of Economic 
Affairs, Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of Finance and TIPA. We brought in um, a, a navigator, what we call, what we call a navigator, someone who could help coordinate meetings, bring people together when we needed them, experts from the public sector and private sector. And over a six month period, we really just examine all of those factors. It's kind of in business what you call a SWOT analysis. Mm -hmm. You look at your strengths, your weaknesses, mm -hmm. your threats, your opportunities, and to determine out of that what should be our priorities. So we had some criteria and that in determined we wanted to find where exactly Tanusha should focus going forward. Mm -hmm. And right. so we look at those sectors where there was a high demand for our products Ex, um, in the global market, in the external market. We look at the OECS market, the French market, as Dr. Samuel, all the markets, where exactly, which of which our sectors, there was a demand for our market, for our products and services. We also looked at those sectors that had a potential to drive growth locally, mm -hmm. um, engage people, where mm -hmm. we're going to have the highest returns in terms of employment and socioeconomic development. So, for example, there are some sectors that just going to, they need people, you know, because of what they are, they will have their high employment, so that, that would rank higher for us. Mm -hmm. we, we also look at sectors that would be able to, to drive innovation mm -hmm. um, because we want to be able to, you know, in the, in the global market, things change very, very quickly. Yeah. You do something today, tomorrow is obsolete. So we wanted to be able to be, to choose sectors that will, as priorities that will <coughs> serve kind of as a fulcrum. Mm -hmm. You could pull up the, the whole um, first towards innovation, and producing what we call high value added items. Because you, you in the global market, you want to get the best return. So if you're going to spend six hours doing something, you want to spend six hours doing something, and when you sell it, you for a high price mm -hmm. to get a high return. And if usually, if you don't understand value chain, you can, there are different areas within the value chain in which a country or a company can intervene. You could either be the primary producer. Mm -hmm. For example, if you do bananas, you grow the farm as a primary producer. If you process it, you could actually be at, at a higher return and, mm -hmm. yet, and you, can, you can have goods processed at different levels before you actually finish goods. Mm -hmm. So all of these things, I may sound technical, but I want you to appreciate all that went in into phase one mm -hmm. to allow us to what we call settle or pick our priorities. Mm -hmm. Because you can do everything in the world, but we don't want to do everything in the world. We want to focus on what we do best. Mm -hmm. What is going to give us the best return? What is going to have the greatest impact on our economy? what is going to create the most jobs for us, what is going to help us in innovation. Mm -hmm. So having set that criteria in phase one, we settled on what we now have at the f as the priority sectors for our export strategy, and we identify what we call cross-sector strategies. These are areas or issues that if we address them, they will impact our economy across the board. And so that was really the output of phase one. So at this point, this is where we are. We've identified the priority export sectors mm -hmm. and identified the cross sector okay. that we want to focus on. Could you briefly tell us what we should look forward to in phase two? Phase two is where we, we delve a little deeper. So for example, you have, you develop sector strategies. Mm -hmm. So we actually determine what actions we need to take now mm -hmm. to develop those sectors. Mm -hmm. So for example, in phase one, we, would, we have agro-processing as a priority. Now in phase two, what do we need to do mm -hmm. to develop the agro-processing okay. sector mm -hmm. so that we can actually see the, the growth in exports, in agro-processing yeah. exports? So phase two is that detailed sector strategy that identifies the key actions needed going forward so mm -hmm. that we can realize that potential. Okay, we will take a, we'll take a break at this point and when we resume, we'll, we'll talk further about phase two of the National Export Strategy Development Process. What's in the food you're eating? Do you really even know? All the chemicals and hormones used to accelerate their growth. All the artificial flavoring, sweeteners and colors too. We consume and we don't spare a thought for the damage that they'll do. The that no, they do. think about the children. Think about the children. How will we save them? Chemicals and GMOs are not the solution use organic and join 
Excessive agrochemical use, additives and genetically modified foods are harmful to health and the environment. Join the good food revolution. Grow, buy and consume organic. A message from Rice St. Lucia and the Ministry of Sustainable Development with funding from the GEF Small Grants Program, UNDP. The good food revolution. Okay, Mrs. Fred, uh, um, uh, I wanted you to tell us a little more about feeds too. And, uh, um, and how entities can participate. Um, thank you. Phase two is very important. Um, phase one, we call it a roadmap. But what we have developed is a roadmap. So we have a document. We have a document that yeah. says these are your priority sectors that you should focus on going forward, and these are the cross sectors that you need to focus on. Mm -hmm. However, it does not tell us what we need to do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say, um, for example, you should address this problem in that way. Mm -hmm. Phase two, what we, what we are going to, to be doing is we are going to be examining those sectors mm -hmm. in detail. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at, for example, for agriculture, where are what we need to develop agriculture. It, there will be issues to deal with standards, there will be issues to do with transportation, there will be issues to do with even the whole process of production, of what happens in, in the field, there'll be a value chain analysis. So we're going to be looking at the value chain mm -hmm. from taking our, from pr producing our crops to getting them to market. Right. And then we will, dis we will understand where we need to intervene. It mm. may be production side, it may be to, to do with the quality, to do with, to do with, it may be transportation, it may be how we package our, our, our products. Mm. Some other, some, for example, we may, we, 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 I'll give you a simple example. We believe that St. Lucia has a very good breadfruit. We've been talking about it so many times. You have a, what is called a St. Lucia breadfruit. But getting that breadfruit to market, mm -hmm. to get it to the market in time, breadfruit can need at least three days to get to market to be, to be sold as it begins to, you know, it'll ripen. It'll be a waste right. of time. How it's packaged so it's not bruised, etc. The, the, the transportation that is available, how it is picked from the time it is picked from the tree. We need to examine all of that to determine what we need to do to, to get our breadfruit to market in the right condition, in the right package, in the, in the right time, mm -hmm. to get the right price. Right. So the phase two activity of the export strategy is extremely important. It for everybody to get participate. The producers mm -hmm. who would like to have the so we what we have formed are uh, sector teams where we bring every party along that 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 chain. So the people doing the packaging, the people doing the transportation, the airline people, the farmers who are growing it, mm -hmm. um, the Ministry of Agriculture officials who were the ones who deal with the regulations and all sorts of things. We must all come together to determine what we need to do, and out of that will become a strategy and a strategy is an action plan it's a, a game plan a playbook mm -hmm. I'm going to put it in simple terms if you play in football there may be different games that you play different strategies on the field that you put in place because you want to win mm -hmm. so we need to come together and put together a playbook an action plan that says for us to win mm -hmm. in, in exporting our breadfruits this is the play, is what we need. So agriculture has to do this, TIPA will have to do that, um, the marketing authority or whatever will have to do that, the farmers will have to do that, the extension office in the ministry will have to do that, the airlines will have to provide these uh, kinds of service so that we then have what I, a strategy. I want people to understand a strategy is a game plan. Mm -hmm. It's what you, a winning game plan. Yeah. And so in phase two, that is when we are mapping out the strategy. And out of that, all agencies, the SMA will, will, will have a clear action plan as to how they support their members in helping export. TIPA will ha have an action plan for itself that says within this game plan is what TIPA needs to do, is what the ministry needs to do. So at this particular stage, it is very important that all the parties participate, the, the government officials participate, the, the, the private sector must participate, and it is going to put a tremendous demand on everybody because, for example, the SMA would have to be sitting in several. Mm -hmm. For example, we have, we, have, we have five or seven priority sectors. I'm pretty sure almost all of them may concern the SME. And so the SME will have to find expertise among its mm -hmm. members to, to sit in seven different committees. But that's how we have to do it. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the phase two really does suck, suck up, let me put it that way, quite a lot of expertise. But it allows us to be very, very pragmatic, very succinct, very detailed. Mm -hmm. And so 
at the end of that, we will have what we call sector strategies. There will be a national strategy for agriculture. There will be a national strategy for agro-processing or manufacturing sector. There will be a national strategy for ICT mm -hmm. because it's a priority. And that is what we are now going to do. And that process will last um, about another, there will be a two-week period in November where we will, experts from the International Trade Center will come to St. Lucia and work with us with these committees simultaneously mm -hmm. so that at the end of two weeks we would have pretty much carved that out. Okay. And so I am appealing to everyone who have, and, and let me not just appeal, I really need to thank first of all of everybody who have been involved in phase one because there was quite a bit of input from the private sector and from the public sector and to ask them to please make the effort to double their efforts in November so we could actually see that ourselves move on to the more critical phase of the export strategy um, in, this, in this phase two. Okay. Um, in phase two, we'll be doing the global value chain analysis and so on. So we enter, we enter in this thing with a blank slate because we need the analysis to know where we're going to do what, right? Um, is the SME preparing its members to participate on, those, on that level? Yes, we will participate. I mean, for us, our biggest concern and our biggest challenge is transportation. Because we hear a lot about moving, right, and mm -hmm. getting ready to export. And the strategy will hopefully find a way for us to sit, maybe with the OECS office, to see where we can arrange some shipping within just the OECS. Because even to move there, we will have the strategy. We are ready to run. Products are ready to ship, and you have no shipping. Yeah, we have this situation. That is a serious situation for the manufacturing yeah. sector. Yeah. Serious for us. Yeah. And um, we still have geese in the region, but geese come up the islands, and we're the last port, and they go back to England. Mm. So there's nobody to take from St. Lucia to go back. And shipping by air is costly. Mm. So you have a Mary Jet, you have another one I think just came in that we can use. But that's a costly process. It's making our product more expensive and therefore even harder to compete. So we are a part of this thing to make sure that the challenges we are having are fixed or attempted to be fixed. Because it's really, really tough to be able to export small packages, small things that people want now for now, and you can't get it to move because we have no shipping. So for us, that's our biggest challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Samuel, how can business organizations, and you hear, you hear the SME lamenting upon one issue about logistics, how can business organizations influence trade policy? Well, they are the, perhaps the most significant client of the, the work of the ministry. They engage actively, especially for someone as, as, as um, I could say, passionate. <laughs> as Ms. James to my left here. And so they definitely, their voice, their views go a long way in shaping the actual, you know, text, the language that, uh, or, or the, the, the various um, instruments of our policy. Mm -hmm. So they are very influential. Um, they, they are not, they don't lie around. They, she calls me whenever <laughs> she hears something on the news, you know, what is this? And, you know, let's make, keeps us on our toes. So. Um, we have regular meetings, um, well, not as regular as we like sometimes, but the, it's open door policy, as the minister has indicated. At any point, she can call the, the permanent secretary, call the trade advisor, and so forth. So um, uh, the BSO, um, especially the St. Lucia Manufacturers Association, mm -hmm. um, definitely is a leading advocate of, of, of on the issues on behalf of its members um, in trying to seek opportunity and to encourage them to take advantage of the opportunities. And they participate in almost all the exercises that we have, anything. I mean, we are doing, just last week, we were talking about Single Window, which is an initiative under the uh, Trade Facilitation Agreement of the WTO. Mm. They involved, just recently, we had a training session on uh, market access database, um, trying to allow them to stay from their computers and their offices to get information on markets, um, you know, you know, just get their, as I say, feet or fingers wet, I don't know which one it is, <laughs> in terms of engaging the, the, the tariff or, or the um, 
border requirements, mm -hmm. what to expect in exporting a good to any place in the region or a country that we have agreements with. So um, I must tell you, I'm encouraged. I know that um, at this juncture, we, we are new to this. We're only a few years into this as we integrate. We're going out to sea, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, as we navigate the waters of, of, of global, global um, trade and so forth. But I'm encouraged by the fact that we are seeing changes. We're seeing some of the work begin to pay some dividends, mm -hmm. and we are going to continue through the dedicated work of the work of TIPA, through the ministry and the Manufacturing Association and other agencies to, to Grow export because, as was said in the opening remarks by my colleague um, 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 Mrs. Flood, to support our consumption uh, through imports, which is the largest economic activity, we have to be able to pay for these imports through foreign exchange, which is earned through exports. At the moment, um, we have seen the decline in our banana industry, and you saw what that did to our what they call our merchandise account and the increased burden on tourism to, to fill the gap. But we have to now diversify the economy, build stronger exports, and begin to improve the numbers. Mm -hmm. And export growth is the way. We have heard the cliche of export-led growth, private sector-led growth. All of that really comes down to us uh, getting more flowing out of mm -hmm. St. Lucia to the rest of the world in services, not mm -hmm. just goods, mm -hmm. but um, in services as well. And as we encourage that orientation and more of our people get involved, I believe the future will be better. Um, my final comment, if I am allowed to, is that um, I want us to begin to think a little more creatively though in terms of how we do those things. We have been for the most part taking a traditional approach um, where we want to produce finished goods from start to finish and um, that is the sort of culture, everything in-house. Now you know the cost of doing that and the risk of doing that is much higher. But if we begin to do, find innovative ways where partnerships where we reduce risk or share risk, pool risk um, through, as I say, taking part in value chains, global value chains, regional value chains, where we can be responsible for one aspect of the whole thing and do it at a much larger scale. Mm -hmm. So the whole system depends on everyone equally. So we have to start to do that in our agreements as well. Not only produce a good from start to finish where we are responsible for the packaging, the labeling, meeting the standards, doing the stuff, dealing with the farmers, you know, all of the elements of, it's quite demanding sometimes and difficult. So we have to begin to think of how we can parcel that out to those who are better mm -hmm. at doing some things while we concentrate on the things that are, we are better at doing. Because I think that's what phase two is about. Phase two, the global value chain analysis, yeah. that's what it would do yes. to find out where we're best placed yes. to produce what at what price and so on. Yes. Um, I have a question for each of you. If we produce this national export strategy and it is to be considered a success, what are some of the major changes that we'd expect to see at the policy level, at the strategy level, and at where the rubber meets the road at the, at the business level, at the firm level. Anybody could go first. <laughs> <laughs> what are the changes we want to see in our institutions? Yeah, see, we have this national export strategy, and it should come to an end at 2021. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In 2021, if I'm alive, what should I see in terms of the evolution of TIPA, the results that come out from TIPA, the changes in firms, and the changes in policy. I would like to go first. Okay. Please do. <laughs> I would love to see a rapid implementation process of whatever it is we do with the value chain. Okay. Because once there's implementation, the manufacturers are ready to step up to the plate. But the implementation is what, for me, is crucial. Because doing the value chain is excellent. We have identified where we want to go. Let us start implementing. Okay, so in 2021, um, what would I see in terms of, like, is there anything that I could see in terms of number of manufacturing firms, uh, productivity levels? Can I, can I answer? Yeah. I mean, all of that for TIPA mm -hmm. translates back into our own strategic planning and performance measurement framework. Okay. So when this strategy is done, and I just bef I want to say it's very important that we do it. But yes, we, we do support the firms, but we have to lead them in having mm -hmm. a, a long-term vision, mm -hmm. having a proactive approach mm -hmm. to development because things change all the time. And yeah. if we don't do that, then we always be on the back foot reacting. 
we need to set a goal and as a, as a nation and work at it. Mm -hmm. And that translates for us into performance manage performance management framework, mm -hmm. where for TIPA, this is something we would like to see. Mm -hmm. And there are goals for TIPA itself. We would, but if this is successful, we should be able to see our client list. Because we want yeah. to see more companies actually exporting. Right. You'd be surprised. Um, because the minimum of companies are small, very few of them are actually exporting. And so for one thing, I would, we would see a growth in just the, the export base, the companies that are exporting. And so TIPA itself should be prepared to transition to manage that change mm -hmm. because our client base would be, would, be, would be much bigger. We also expect to see a diversity in our markets. There are some things that have been the same for a long, long time. Um, and it is that we have, our exports have been going to the same few markets and our export base has been very narrow. That should change, especially when it comes to the service. And it needs to change. And if, I know time is running out, but one thing that is very important for a country like ours is the resilience as well. Mm -hmm. It's very important that our export base diversify for the purpose of resilience. Mm -hmm. Look, for example, we talked earlier about Dominica. And as Dominica has gone through this, if, if there, was, there were more exporters in the service sector, many of these exporters, like from, for example, in ICT, could still be earning income, even while the country is building back the bricks and mortar businesses. So mm -hmm. for us, in, if this is successful, we should see an export base that is much more resilient. We mm -hmm. should see an increase in export, exporters. We should see an increase in our markets. Thank you. I think I'm kind of rushing. I know you ran into a break, but it's something we can develop further. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. We are now proceeding to another break. When we come back, we'll talk further about what we expect to see in 2021 if the national export strategy is successful. La main pop c'est chimin bon santé. Il est absolument nécessaire pour laver la main si vous voulez tienne bon santé. Quand même si vous pas ou ça fait ces bagages là. Coûter. Laver la main souvent et puis glo net ex avant après condition qui ca simer 20 minutes. Par exemple, on est pour laver la main après vous changer d'ailleurs pas. Servi pour vite, ou tu peux monde qui blessé et ben malade. Après vous tu peux les animaux et après ou entamer zordi. Et si ou pas ni glo, ou ça servi ça yo ka kouye hand sanitizer et ben alcool pour 30 secondes. Laver la main souvent, ça c'est une manière pour empêcher maladie. Si vous voulez plus d'informations, prenez le bureau d'information santé à numéro 468-5349. Dr. Samuel, yes. um, by 2021, it is said sometimes that uh, strategies could influence the shaping of policies, well, it seems as policy influences the shaping of strategies. If this national export strategy is to be successful, what sort of changes do you expect you know, at the policy level? Um... I would expect that the, the, the policies would uh, be complementary um, to ensuring this is successful and, and I, I basically expect that um, all the supporting requirements to drive uh, the, the strategy, drive the policy um, would be better embraced by any administration that leads the country. Um, we're talking about funding, training and all of the what they call the bits and pieces in the milieu, in the environment, will be given. Because you see, the buy-in is important. And sometimes I get a sense we're selling stones to the moon and, and you know, we're preaching, but, you know, not always to the converted. And, you know, so there's a little bit of skepticism sometimes, you know, people see trade. Even some of our arrangements, CSME is like an event. You know, when was that? Was that last year? You know, not seeing that this is part of an ongoing relationship uh, arrangement that is here to stay is part of, you know, it's just part of what, what, what we have now. So I am hoping that this strategy would have the kind of buy-in that the policy mix that is needed to ensure its success. Now I didn't itemize them, but just generally the leadership needs to come from um, our, our, our government at the executive level and to support whether we have the services policy, we talk about investment policy and all the other bits and pieces um, would be coming together in a sort of a coordinated push to drive this, the success of, of the national export development strategy. So um, really this is really what is needed. I think the, the message has gone out and we are seeing it in this panel again and, and those who are listening, we hope they will take note. 
All right, in the little time that we have left, um, there's this big elephant in the room nobody talked about. And uh, I mean, you alluded to it a little bit, but where is the funding coming from? <laughs> well, there are, two, there are two elephants. I think, um, <laughs> you know, when Dr. Samuel, before I answer you, when Dr. Samuel was speaking, mm -hmm. um, it brought back to my mind the saying that culture eats strategy for lunch every day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know. And that's one of the things that we're hoping that by just by what we're doing here, that we can, we can change people's mindset because there must be an appreciation mm -hmm. for the fact that we need to diversify our economy. There must be an appreciation for the fact that we have an opportunity to grow. There is, there is opportunity. It's not, I mean, or else there's no point in going out and, and have agreements and negotiating space. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the things that we are going to be dealing with in the strategy will involve mindsets, changing mindsets, changing mindsets attitude, towards productivity, yeah. mm -hmm. attitudes, people understanding that we need to produce more. Mm -hmm. When in the same six hours our competitors can produce X, we must be able to produce the same amount because we have the intellect, we have the ability, we have the equipment, we have everything. So there's going to, for this to happen, one of the reasons it's called a national export strategy is because it takes a national effort and because it needs people at every level to embrace and to, to make it happen. So. Yes, so if it's successful, we will be successful. If it's successful in 2020, there will, there will, need, there will be significant change that we will be able to observe among, among our own selves as a country. Um, the challenge of funding is, is there, it's real. But I always believe that when we work together, the little bit we have can go much further. The danger, the real danger is when we off. We, we do not get together and do it in the way we're doing it now. When each party goes off and does something that looks good of, to them or to their own purpose, and then we're all at odds. And I keep saying it's like a bushfire. You can have a bushfire which burns everything down, <laughs> it's, it's visible, and it, you have all the heat, or you can have a laser where you take the same energy, you concentrate that energy, and you can cut through the wall. So we, I think, by coming together and putting our best efforts towards developing a national export strategy is the best approach. We have to understand that. The change must come right here. It's the best approach whereby we can, the BS, the, the Manufacturing Association, the Ministry, TIPA, all the other stakeholders could be working towards the same end. That's the first thing. And I can assure you that is the most cost effective way of doing it. Um, when, we, when we have come to the conclusion as to what we want to do, we're going to have to put our money where our mouth is. Um, it's not going to happen without some resources being put to the table. We are a TPO, a trade promotion agency, and there are other trade promotion agencies in the world who are being funded, who are making miles ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So yes, there will be a need for the government to, uh, to accept this. Mm -hmm. If it is done it, it, but at the highest level, as Dr. Wa um, Samuel said, it will have to be endorsed by the cabinet and it will have to be funded. It will have to be treated with the priority deserves and they will need to be funding. There will be um, other agencies, of course, we always go out who can support us, but mm -hmm. we must be committed to our own export strategy. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so in 2021, we're looking for a new culture of cooperation among local stakeholders for the common good of St. Lucia. You said that you're looking for rapid implementation of future projects and so on. <laughs> um, <laughs> that we should have... Of the strategy. Of the strategy. Of the strategy. Well, the strategy will use a future project. <laughs> yeah. Strategy. Yeah. The strategy. And uh, um, we're also looking for more companies where the TIPA's client base would uh, enlarge. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that uh, there will be market diversity, like you say. Resilience. And market resilience. Economic resilience through export development. And a closer cooperation between the parties involved and the process of developing trade policy. Yes. Right. Well, we have now come to the close of this panel discussion. I want to thank everybody for participating. And I hope that the public can participate in the whole process of developing the national export strategy. It is St. Lucia's national export strategy, and it belongs to all of us. Thank you.